It is Spinal Anatomy. It is week nine. It is Tuesday. It is the spring of 2021. And we already have our first California wildfire going. You guys weren't here last summer. Last summer it was so smoky that you had to have your headlights on for maybe two or three days driving around in the daytime. Crazy California. And now it looks like it's starting again. You could see them. You could see the smoke. Oh, wow. That was the old fires or the new fires? The old ones. I was going to say, I hope they're not that bad already. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, this is crazy. Crazy California. It's just gotten so crazy. California actually had, for the first time, they had, I think it was 200,000, 150,000, 200,000 people leave for the first time ever. Because it's just getting so crazy here. Anyway, enough about that. Off we go. So remember Atlas and Axis? Let's see. Atlas has, or Axis has that little dens, right? I've been talking a lot about Axis, or Atlas already, which is here on the left. You guys can see my pointer too? Okay, great. Yes. All right. All right, so you're familiar with that already. There is a, another picture of the two together. And you can see how important this ligament, um, it's so important I'm going to take time to draw it real quick. So colliculus atlantis, does that sound familiar? That's that little bump right there. There's the other colliculus atlantis. And let's see, let's do, do I have purple? I have pink color. So we have the transverse ligament of atlas goes just like that. And there's the facet for the transverse ligament of atlas. So we've talked about that, how important that is. We'll talk a little bit more about this ligament today. We're going to go through all the ligaments right after this is done. But All right, anyway, uh, this is a nice CT scan. It's actually a CT myelogram because you can see... Normally you can't see the cerebrospinal fluid on a CT, for goodness sake. So that's all contrast that you can see there. There's the cut line. So this is the sagittal view on this side, on the left. And you see the orange cut line cuts through here. So picture yourself, if you're making a bologna sandwich and you sliced part of a salami up, you could take this, pull this slice out, and throw it over here on the bread. And this is now we have a top-down view. It's really an eye to S view from underneath. So the left side is over here, right side is over here on this side. Uh, but you can see the ADI space we've talked about, very important. Should never, ever, ever be greater than what? How many millimeters? Three millimeters. Don't forget that number. You need that number to get into clinic. You got a CCP exam you got to take, and you have to memorize that number. All right. So the kind of the star of the next section. I don't think we've talked about this. This is foramen magnum here. Well, that isn't. But the foramen magnum would be this hole right here. We've looked at that, I think, in the bottom of the skull. Um, but there it is. It's made by occiput in the basilar uh, portion here of occiput. And the other star of the show, which you don't know much about yet, is this thing. We can see part of it. This is the cerebellum. It's part of your noodle. Coordination center and all kinds of stuff here. This is the inferior peduncle of the cerebellum. This guy or girl or whatever, it should never, ever, ever extend below a line drawn between these two processes. Right? It should never go down like this. 
Because if it goes down like that, what's going to happen to the spinal cord? It's going to get squished, isn't it? So that's where we're going. We're going to talk about that condition. These patients, I've had a handful of them over the years. They come in and they always say the same thing. I got this weirdest headache and it always happens when I sneeze really hard or I cough really hard. And the headache can be there for hours or even days and it's a severe headache. They have to leave work when it happens. So they're terrified to sneeze or cough. Because, of course, that increases the pressure inside the thecal sac and smashes the cord even more when they cough. Right? So, yep. Cerebellum. I would be happy to do that. Yeah, this is the peduncle of the cerebellum. And we'll see a better picture. I'll show you. We've got pictures coming of it. But that's it right there. This is the spinal cord. Um, the spinal cord ends right here. This is the medulla oblongata right here. And you will get your neural anatomy. Don't you worry. Um, this is the occipital portion of the clivus. And this is the squamous portion of the occiput, which you will learn for next quarter. Right, so foramen and magnet should never go behind that, below that line, and you will study that further on down the road. Uh, there's a better picture in MRI. We can see stuff a lot better. There's the cerebellum. Kind of looks like cauliflower, I think. And there's the foramen magnum. It should never go below that foramen magnum. Okay, there's another, just another one. It's okay if it comes up close to it. Some authors say it can go down a little bit more. But you can see that cerebral peduncle right there. All right. So now, with that in mind, we need to talk about something called Chiari malformation. Chiari malformation. AKAs, of course, not too bad with the AKAs. Arnold Chiari malformation. Uh, is the official name. Everybody just calls it Chiari malformation, uh, malformation. Hindbrain hernia. That won't be on a board because that tells you exactly what the problem is. They're going to say Chiari malformation or Arnold Chiari malformation. It is a congenital condition uh, from an embryological defect either in the foramen magnum or an overgrowth of the cerebellum itself. And the defect, whatever the cause, the cerebellar tonsils have went down through the foramen magnum. Um, sometimes even the medulla itself goes down and it's caught and it pinches the spinal cord and it can cause remember there's that little central canal in the middle of the spinal cord that cerebrospinal fluid flows, flows through that can get pinched and cause a beaver dam. And then upstream from that, it can hollow out the cord. It can, just like a beaver dam, upstream from a beaver dam, the river gets really big, right? And it can cause a big cavity inside the spinal cord itself. And that's called a syringomyelia, or the condition is called syringomyelia. The, the hollowed out tube, the overblown central canal, is called a syrinx. Syrinx, and you'll get a lot more of that as you go through the program. Uh, leads to a condition called hydromyelia. Uh, prevalence is fairly rare, 0.1% of the population, but not, for example, Marfan syndrome. We've all heard of Marfan syndrome, I think, or most of us. That that prevalence is 0.01% of the population, so it's more common. It's out there. You'll run into this a handful of times during your career. Uh, there are four different types of it. We're not going to worry about most of them. Type 1 we'll talk about and type 2 a little bit. Type 1 is the run-of-the-mill one where the cerebellar tonsil herniates through the foramen magnum. Type 2 is more severe. Not only does the cerebellum herniate, but uh, the fourth ventricle uh, and even the, med the medulla in the fourth ventricle can even herniate itself. So it's just a much more severe herniation and then we won't worry about the type 3 but it gets crazy the back of the head doesn't form and all sorts of stuff all right so here is a 53 year old who came in 
uh, your practice, imagine, complaining of chronic headaches and dizziness or vertigo, uh, which can be triggered by a strong sneeze. That's the key, that strong, that Valsalva's event that's called. Like if you're, it can be triggered if they're really constipated and they're on the toilet and they're pushing down with all their might. Or if they're having a baby and they're pushing the baby out with all their might and not breathing. Um, it can trigger these things. And so what do you think of this MRI? So it's a little harder to see. Well, not really. You can see this one. I didn't blow it. Peduncle. Yep. You got it. I think I blew it up right here. You got it. So here's the foramen, here's the squamous portion of the occiput. There's the basilar portion. So the foramen magnum would be right about here. And then we can definitely see the peduncle is way, it's almost down to atlas, isn't it? There's the posterior tubercle of atlas. Uh, so, Chiari malformation, and specifically it's a Chiari 1. I don't see a syrinx. Sometimes you could see a nice white syrinx right inside the cord like that. It causes all kinds of neurological problems. Very serious condition. How do they fix it? The surgeon will, kind of easy really. Surgeon just cuts off this part of the occiput and makes more room for it. The only trouble is then more of it can herniate down, uh, but that's usually the treatment for it. This is a type 1. Type 1 without a syrinx. Okay, Arnold Carey malformation without syrinx. All right, so I'll talk a little deeper about Arnold 1 or Carey uh, type 1. A carry malformation. Uh, many of the pap patients have this. They're completely asymptomatic. They have no clue that they even have it. They can live their whole lives. No big deal. So it can be what's called an incidental finding. Um, and the brain stem and the upper spinal cord can be compressed, of course, by the peduncle being down there. Kind of everything I said. Classic symptom is the development of a severe disabling headache following a sneeze or some other's Valsalva's event. Do you guys know what Valsalva's test is yet? Does anybody know what that is? Yep. So it's doing a squat with holding your breath. That that would that would do it. But you you when you do a Valsalva's test, you have the patient take a deep breath in. Don't let the air out and push down real hard like you're constipated or like you're trying to push out a baby or whatever scenario works. And that's a Valsalva's test. And disc herniation makes the disc herniation poke out further and it could cause more sciatica. Not a good sign if that test is positive. All right, in addition to the headaches, there's other weird symptoms and neck pain is common as well, but they get uh, a little wobbly. So they have trouble with balance, ataxia, because of compression of the proprioceptive tracts that are in the spinal cord. They don't have good hand coordination. They have trouble keyboarding and mousing. They have tingling and paresthesia on their hands. Uh, dysphagia, they might have trouble speaking. Um, they could have drop attacks where they develop syncope. Syncope is fainting, basically speech problems, blurred vision, dizziness. So they don't always, they may just have a headache and that's it. All the patients I've ever seen, all they have is a headache and neck pain. They don't have any of these more serious symptoms, but they could. So type 2 Arnold Carey malformation, or just Carey malformation, it's just a more severe hernia uh, where not only does the peduncles of the cerebellum herniate, but the fourth ventricle and the medulla as well. Now, these are often associated with neural tube defects as well. And now we need to go down the neural tube defect rabbit hole. And I do like this. This is a very juicy lecture. It's a lot of good stuff for boards and for, uh, for my test as well. So let's go down the neural tube defect rabbit hole. Um, and now we have to use our embryology powers because we talked about neurulation already if, you, if you're up to date on your embryology lectures.
By the way, talk about embryology, I don't know if anybody noticed, but I did upload yesterday's lecture. Just because we have a holiday doesn't mean I don't give you a lecture. By the f forces above say you cannot miss lectures. So I had to give you a lecture when you weren't even here. So go watch that on Dr. Doug's YouTube lecture page. And somebody can let me know if you can't find it. I already uploaded the slides. Uh, but we talked about neurulation, and we talked about how the neural pores zip up, and the, and the neural plate forms a tube. Sometimes it never zips up, and that causes a neural tube defect. And there can be little super common problems that are no big deal, or horrible problems that are life-threatening. So this is one of the most common anomalies uh, in the human, a congenital anomaly. What's congenital mean again? Congenital? Yep, from birth. You come out of the chute and you got it. So, yeah, let's get into the different neural tube defects. Uh, what causes them, too? Shots of tequila could do it. Uh, things called teratogens. Teratogens. And the third week of pregnancy is the most sensitive time. The developing fetus is very sensitive to uh, outside poisons like alcohol cocaine, herpes simplex, getting an x-ray, you know, um, folic acid deficiency. That's why pregnant people always have to take folic acid. These all greatly increase the risk. doesn't mean that the child's going to have a birth defect, but it does greatly increase the risk uh, for it as well. So you need to be careful. The trouble is, do you, do you even know you're pregnant in the third week? Most of the time you don't even know that you're, you're pregnant. So just... Yep. So that's that's the problem, but I mean, not much we can do about it. Um, prenatal screening is very important. Um, there is one particular thing I want you to know, this thing called alpha fetoprotein. So if you have increased levels of this protein um, in the parent's bloodstream, um, it can not be a good thing. Um, and it can it can indicate the presence of a neural tube defect. It has to be just right. If you have way decreased alpha fetoprotein, that's not good either. A Down syndrome, which is a very common birth problem, um, trisomy 21 has alpha fetoprotein levels really, really low. So alpha fetoprotein is one. So make sure you know if it's really high, neural tube defect. If it's really no, low, Down syndrome. All right, let's start going through these. So spina bifida occulta first. I think I've actually even showed you one of these. This is the most common neural tube defect. And it's hardly a neural tube defect. It's because the thecal sac is fine. All the meninges are fine. The only problem is the posterior arch or the vertebral arch didn't quite fuse together. And there's a little gap in the bone. We actually have a naturally occurring spina bifida occulta. Uh, that's the sacral hiatus, right? It's a naturally occurring spina bifida. Uh, so not really that, that big of a deal. Um, seen at L L5 and S1 in about 10% of normal humans. So you're going to see this all the time when you x-ray people. And you don't want to scare the patient at all about this. Um, if it's in a newborn child, uh, it is associated sometimes with other congenital problems like heart problems and kidney problems and such. But in and of itself, it's not, it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. The dural sac is fine. The thecal sac is fine. Everybody's happy. And this is our bone that we've looked at this sacrum before. And you can see a split right there. And that is what it looks like on x-ray. This is actually L5 on x-ray. But you can see that radiolucent line. And, yeah, that's a spina bifida culta. No big deal. Here's a cartoon uh, just showing, and this is even a little more severe than normal, but it's just showing that the, the bony vertebral arch is, just has a hole in it right here. 
Notice the little tuft of hair though, and there's there's some warnings that these are down underneath. And this is extreme, um, but this will get your attention. Um, so that has a name that's called a Franz beard or a Franz tail. You need to memorize that number until you get out of school because that's on part one, two, three, and probably part four boards. Franz beard. That when you see that, you should always x-ray the patient. Don't ever do a grade 5 manipulation when you see. And it's usually not this much. It's usually just a tiny little bit. Uh, there's, you can also see port wine stains down here. It's like, um, I should have put a picture of it in, but you'll get it when you go through the program. Just a little wet red discoloration of the skin down here. That's another sign that there's something something wrong underneath. It's usually just a spina bifida occulta, no big deal. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes you could have agenesis of the entire vertebral arch. And you wouldn't want to adjust somebody who doesn't have a vertebral arch. You might hurt them. So <clears throat> that's also called, when it's hairy, hypertrichinosis is another word for that. Another thing that you can look for are sacral dimples. And you, I mean, you're probably not normally going to look at this, but uh, the anus would be down here, and then we have a fake anus right here. And that's called the sacral dimple. Those also are pretty strong. Probably 50, 60 percent of the kids will have a spina bifida or some type of structural problem underneath there as well. So watch out for those things. Here is just um, a very gassy person. See all the black gas in here? It makes it harder to look at these things. When they superimpose bone, it looks like a tumor. There's a IUD right there. Um, but yeah, do you, you guys see a problem? Well, let's find out. There's the ribs. See the ribs up there? One, two, three, four, five. What's the matter with five? No, it has a spina bifida, a culta. How those transverse processes look on five? Because you can see the transverse processes here. You can hallucinate them in. There's a better one right up here at L1. They look massive, don't they? They're huge. So that's that's complete. Yes, and that's exactly what that's called. It's called sacralization of L5. That's a transitional segment. About 7% of the population, you'll run into that. It can be associated with chronic back pain. Oh, I had a blow up of it. Now you can see it better. Transverse process are completely spatulated. It looks like it's actually fused into the sacrum. So probably, if it's fused together, it usually doesn't cause any trouble. It's when you have one, sometimes it makes a neoarthrosis, a new joint, and that causes trouble. All right, now let's get into the more serious types of spina bifida. So spina bifida occulta, no big deal. Spina bifida cystica, is a big deal. Cystica is bad. So this is, has some AKAs, spina bifida with meningeal seal, spina bifida aparta is a common one, spina bifida manifesta is another AKA. I'm going to call it cystica. And there's two, there's a couple subcategories under, under this as well. And yes, the categorization is a mess. Not as bad. Wait till we get to fifth quarter and we talk about the gastropathies, like chronic tummy upset. What a horrible mess. Two, two slides of AKAs, just ridiculous. So this is nothing compared to what you're going to see when you get in fifth quarter. Anyway, this is a neural tube defect, which results uh, in a failure of the vertebral arch to form. Not a little tiny little tiny defect like we saw, like the whole vertebral arch or most of it doesn't even form at all. And then sometimes the thecal sac never forms either or the, you know, the thecal sac goes all the way up to the foramen magnum. So 
Yeah, so this one, spina bifida cystica, always allows some type of neural tissue to herniate through the defect. So this is the first time we've had anything herniate through the defect. Um, ligamentum flavum can go through the defect. Um, sometimes the thecal sac doesn't even form. Um, so we can have all kinds of problems with this. This is still twice as common as Marfan syndrome. This is 0.02%. still rare, though. Maybe see one of these in your career. There's three types of these, actually. There's the meningeal seal, and I'll tell you right now, make those of you who don't know what to study, make yourself a note card, because this, this is going to be on the test and go to be on your boards. Uh, three types of spina bifida cystica. Three subcategories. There's the meningeal seal, uh, meningeal myelocele. Some, some people call it meningomyelocele, meningocele. I always just call it meningeal seal, meningeal myelocele. Uh, and myeloschisis. And that's the same as rachiscisis. We talked about that in embryology uh, after neural tube defects. So that's a strong AKA myeloschisis, the double kiss word. Myeloschisis and radioschisis. And so let's go through these. Meningeal seal, uh, and these are kind of in in the the level of severity. This is the least severe. Meningomyeloceal is worse, and uh, myeloschisis is the is the worst of all. So kind of bad, medium bad, and terrible bad. So let's look at meningeal seal. Sometimes it's called spina bifida with meningeal seal or meningeal cyst is a AKA and it's a subclass of spina bifida cystica. Uh, occurs when only the thecal sac herniates through the vertebral arch defect. The 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 elements of the spinal cord don't. So all the traversing nerve roots are still in place. But the thecal sac does expand and herniate outward. And so you do have cerebral spinal fluid inside this sac that is outside of the uh, of the body. So gross pictures coming up for so those of you are sensitive don't watch this if you're sensitive. Not yet. Gross pictures are definitely coming though. Here's a cartoon of that same picture and now we have no vertebral arch. And we see that the thecal sac, or dural sac, has gotten huge. And so this is all filled with cerebral spinal fluid. But the spinal cord in this drawing, and if we were in the lumbar spine, the, the caudoquina would still be in place. So it's kind of an empty sac. It's not empty. It's got, it's got cerebral spinal fluid in it. But it's not as bad as it can get. Now it's going to get worse. So meningomyloceal or spina bifida with meningomyoseal. Uh, this one, not only the thecal sac is out, but the cauda quina or the spinal cord, depending on what level this happens, uh, the darn nerves are outside the thecal sac, and this is not a good thing to have. It's a much greater chance of having some type of neurological deficit with this. And here you can see the spinal cord is out inside that little sac, and if you're in the lumbar spine, you can see all the traversing nerve roots have stretched way out in the sac. If you poked it with a needle, cerebral spinal fluid would come shooting out of there. Um, so not, not good. Right, here's some babies. There's a meningeal mile seal. And it's hard to tell this, these apart, right? You'd have to do histological analysis or an ultrasound to see what's inside there. This one just has fluid in there, so there's no neural tissue. This was a, main, um, a meningomalo seal, and you can see the baby's feet are all messed up. So the cauda the thecal sac, and the nerve roots are all tangled up in here and not working. I think we saw one of these one of the first days where we saw the little the little tail coming off the baby. We saw one of these just like this. So not good. And then the last uh, one is myloscus kiss, um, aka rachiscus kiss, the kiss kiss one. Kiss kiss is bad. Rachiscus kiss is bad. Um, and this one is often fatal. It, it, if you're born with this, you usually don't make it because not only is the thecal sac outside, the thecal sac is usually open. So there's no skin, there's no thecal sac. Notice at least there's skin covering these things. 
This one, there may be nothing. It may be real neural tissue you're born with outside of the body. And that's, I mean, I don't know how you can even survive like that. I guess there's some surgeries they can do to try to put things back together, but it's just a really bad, uh, a bad diagnosis. The neural tube has failed to close, and the spinal cord is outside. No arch, no meninges, no skin. And it looks like that. There's the spinal cord out in the sunshine. So not a good thing. And there's a baby with one. And you can see it's completely exposed. I guess it looks like there's a little, some kind of a membrane around there in this one. But yeah, this this is not good. No, they typically don't live long. Yeah, they get infected and, I mean, you're... Your, your CNS is exposed. Once they come out of mommy, there's all kinds of germs, and they usually get an infection of the brain and, or of the spinal cord. And that's usually what gets them. Right, there's a picture of it. Rachiscus. All right, now there's a, one more slide here. So there's just kind of a, another way to classify things. So... The, just the generic term spina bifida can be broken down into two parts. Well, we kind of did this, spina bifida culta, um, and then spina bifida aparta uh, is the other one. Another AKA for that is open spinal dysraphism is another common AKA. It just means, means those, same, those same categories we saw, uh, meningomyocele, meningo, uh, meningocele, meningomyocele. Rachiscus is in there as well. Uh, and then there's a spina bifida manifesta. So some authors will say spina bifida culta is nothing. Spina bifida manifesta is everything else that's bad. So that's just other ways that people break those down. All right, so that is enough. A juicy lecture. Lots of note cards on that stuff. And let's close this one down see if there's any questions and let's let's just keep this meeting right on going right we'll, and we'll go through the because um, you all missed lab we might as well just do it right here all right off we go so the star of the show today is ligaments of the cervical spine some of these you already know the names of some of them you don't. So let's go through these. The ligaments. So we have this weird one. This is only seen in the midline. Um, this is called the nuchal ligament. It goes down to C7. Let me see where I am. Two, three, four. That's C7. So it goes from here. up to the back of the occiput and it's very it's fairly thin like it's it's like if I did a pair a cut a couple a couple cuts deep into the plane of the page or a couple cuts out of the plane of the page it'd be gone what does it do because the it holds the head up basically your neck is a little skinny pole and you got this fairly large skull on top of it which is heavy uh, and when you bend forward not so much in your younger people what when you get older and lose muscle I mean you, you need some help and this thing helps hold up the head it's one of the jobs of it in surgery this is why you can't do a discectomy you can't cut through this thing uh, because uh, in a certain percentage of patients they'll get head drop their head will be drooped down and they can't pick it up because they've wrecked uh, this nuchal ligament. So that's ligamentum nuchae. Um, we have the vertebral artery. So this is V1. V1 goes into C6 transverse foramen. This is V2 is straight. V2, 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 V2. And once it goes through C2, it becomes V3. And once it comes out of C1, it's still V3. 
and once it pokes through the, th the fecal sac, which we can't see, but kind of into the plane of the page, it becomes V4 once it gets surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid. All right, we have a ligament here. This is the posterior atlantal occipital membrane. This is the one that can calcify and create a posterior ponticle. Right, really strange when that happens. Uh, we have facet joint capsules. Can't really see them that good on this one. I'll wait to another one. We have the transverse processes would be right here. This is the articular pillar right here. Here's the articular the capsules right here. They're covering the Z joints. Lamina right here. I mean, technically, the pars would be right in between the superior and inferior articular process. There's the superior. There's the inferior. And, yeah, these are the interspinous ligaments here. There's a supraspinous ligament the author didn't really draw in, but that would be here. And what else? Spinous process, you know what those are. Anterior tubercle of atlas posterior tubercle of atlas, posterior arch of atlas, uh, mastoid process, and uh, what else? This one right here, not the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane, but the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane, anterior longitudinal ligament is right here. Okay, I think I got everything. Costal facet, I think, was on there. There's T1, superior full costal facet. Transverse costal facet right there. All right, that's into that one. So this one, this is a P to A view of atlas and axis where the posterior arch has been removed. So you can see the pedicles have been cut right there and right there. Uh, the spinal cord has been removed and we can see uh, the stuff kind of in front of the spinal cord. So this is the, it looks like a cross, right? It looks like a cross. That's called the cruciform ligament. Cruciform ligament. It's made up of two parts. There's superior fibers here um, or any similar AKA the upper limb sometimes it's called. Um, these are the inferior fibers down here. Right, and this is, we know this one, this is the transverse ligament, transverse ligament of atlas. Aller ligaments right here, they connect into the dens, we've talked about those. Let's see, this is a new one. It's going from atlas to axis, so that's the accessory atlantoaxial ligament. It's right here. Facet joint capsule. Uh, this is between, this is atlantoaxial facet joint capsule, or just the capsule between C1 and 2. This is the capsule between occiput and C1. That's it. Super important ligaments there. So make sure you know those well. Um, we've talked about all these already. So this is kind of neat. This is the very last ligamentum flavum right here. So the end of ligamentum flavum is between C1 and C2. We have a continuation of ligamentum flavum, but it's thinner and it's a little broader, and that's that posterior atlanto occipital membrane. And here is a posterior ponticle. Right? We said weirdly it calcifies right there where the vertebral artery goes in. What part of the vertebral artery is this? V one? No. Two? No. V three, yes. V4 is in the cerebral spinal fluid. This is also V3. This is V2. Okay, we've got a 
facet joint capsule, the atlantoaxial facet joint capsule here, or just the capsule between occiput and C1. Um, inferior nuchal line, I think that's in there somewhere, would be right here. Mastoid process is the meeting point of the superior nuchal line, which we don't have on this picture. I think that's a fake answer. Posterior tubercle. Is that the lamina right there? Nope, it's posterior arch. Posterior arch. All right, another complicated one. So this is a mid-sagittal cut through the upper cervical spine. We, we've talked about most of these, I think. But let's look at them from this angle. Um, so this one right here is the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. So ligamentum flavum is here. This artist did a terrible job at this. Um, this is ligamentum flavum, this whole piece right here. This is really facet joint capsule into the plane of the page. So this is not a great drawing. Um, this is mid-sagittal, so this would be nuchal ligament. Posterior longitudinal ligament is nice here. Posterior longitudinal ligament morphs into this. This is new, called the tectoral membrane. Tectoral membrane. It's like the posterior longitudinal ligament. Tectoral membrane. Like the posterior longitudinal ligament, but starting at C2, it just gets thinner. They give it a different name. Transverse ligament of Atlas is right here. Kind of a weird look at it. Um, this is the apical ligament of the dens. That's new. Call it the apical ligament of the dens. Um, that's behind this ligament right here. So these are just the upper fibers of the cruciform ligament. Um, this is the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane. This is the anterior longitudinal ligament there, there, and there. And did I get them all? think I did. All right, that is it. So play that back. Send me email questions if you have them. And we're done. You can take off. I'll I'm going to shut this down though. And I'll pop